And our next guest has been described as the grandfather of the cannabis industry in, yeah. in the USA. Uh, Myrtle and I were really delighted to be able to meet him when we were in America last year. We, in his hood in Harborside Dispensary, is uh, his flagship dispensary. Basically, uh, when you talk about um, the amount of times that you have to pick yourself off the floor, being an activist and getting nailed every time, Steve D'Angelo is actually the master of the game. They've taken so many knocks over the years, but he's just one of those tenacious activists that is now reaping the benefits of everything that he's put in over the last 30, 40 years. I've watched those, all of his YouTube things that they put out from yeah. Harborside. I mean, when they came out, I was so yeah. amazed. So, yeah, yeah. Really. OG. Yeah. Steve D'Angelo, I believe you're on the Zoom waiting to come to Johannesburg. Good evening. <laughs> there he is. Well, good evening, yes. uh, or good morning, or good afternoon, as the case may be, wherever you are. Yeah. Um, it's 420 uh, everywhere. It's lovely to be with you <laughs> here. Great to be in Johannesburg. Yeah. Steve, it's uh, 20 to 8 in the evening on a Thursday in Johannesburg. Welcome to Africa for the first time. Um, the last time you and I met in September last year, no sound? Can you hear me? No, no, you... Can you turn? I, I I need a little more volume. My rock and roll ears, guys. <laughs> turn it up. Okay. okay. <laughs> Your rock and roll ears. Okay. There we go. All right, Steve. Um, the last time we met in September last year, it was a totally different world. And for the last three months, South Africa has been on a pretty hectic lockdown ourselves. It's quite a brutal one around here. There's no quarter. The cops are really heavy handed. We've been chatting to people around America over the weeks. We spoke to Danny Danko in New York City, and he told us about the lockdown there and how they've been affected. We spoke to uh, Russ Belleville in Portland, Oregon, to see how it was going there. How's it going with you in San Francisco with these crazy times that we're living in at the moment? Well, in, in, in the entire state of California, cannabis has been declared an essential business, and so the lockdown does not apply to us. Uh, so from a business point of view, there, there really hasn't been very much change um, in, in, in our lives. In terms of lockdown, um, having consumed a, a vast amount of cannabis through my lungs in my life and being 62 years old, I made a decision to isolate myself uh, long before the lockdown happened. And I'm, I'm maintaining that decision um, and, and you know, doing most of the work that I used to do in person the way that we're doing it now. Uh, I see uh, there's a newspaper headline online this morning in South Africa that um, your governor in California has decided to double back down on your lockdown conditions. There seems to be a flare up. Harborside stays open all the time for your medical patients. Am I correct? Well, we're open for everybody. Um, uh, you know, all the Harborside cops are licensed to serve both medical cannabis patients and any adult who wants to consume cannabis for whatever reason, therapeutic or otherwise, that they that they choose to. So um, the lockdowns really, if anything, they may have boosted sales a, a little bit yeah. uh, because people have you know more time to consume yeah. cannabis. It used to be that a lot of folks only had half a day or part of a day to consume cannabis, and now we're able to do it longer. So um, our, our business is, is, if anything, it's been a little bit of a benefit to the business. Okay. So, and you weren't wrapped up in any of those terrible pictures of the riots that we saw a month ago when it all exploded countrywide. I saw pictures of some dispensaries in downtown San Francisco, particularly in LA, was hit badly. You, you, you're intact, yeah? You're, everything's fine. All of our people are fine, which is the important thing. We did have uh, we did have some burglaries that happened while the riots were going on, and the police were otherwise distracted. They were professional gangs of thieves who have been targeting us for years. So we did suffer some some losses there, um, but uh, it, it it everybody's fine, everything's good, and the business continues to go on. So I'm I'm not terribly concerned about that. Um, the, you know, for us, there's just been this tremendous uh, awakening in the United States now to the reality of racial injustice and, and in particular the reality of police brutality and, and police murders, which have just gotten completely out of control uh, here. 
So that's really what, what I've been focused on. Most of my efforts have been focused on the last prisoner project and doing the best that we can to get mostly black and brown people who have been imprisoned on cannabis charges out before COVID kills them. Right. Yeah. Well, I saw the other day that uh, Melissa Etheridge has just joined the fold. I mean, it's really exciting, Steve. The big, big names in entertainment with massive social media followings are now joining you to to base it this is going to be your defining work i that's my opinion i think it's the most incredible thing that you've set out to do whether you, you say personally that even if it doesn't get done in your lifetime it will carry on but i think you're onto something absolutely magnificent tell us a, a, a bit about the people that are joining the the on mass now Uh, you, 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 Faisal, repeat that question for me one more time. Certainly, man. We were just—I was just excited to see that the likes of Melissa Etheridge and James Belushi uh, have both joined the Last Prisoner Project as ambassadors. These are big names, and it's just going to get bigger and bigger and more powerful. Well done to you, Steve. How's it going with the Last Prisoner Project? Well, it's, it's going well uh, from a point of view of, of the organization. Um, we have, as a result of what I call the Great Awakening here in the United States, we're seeing a lot more engagement by cannabis companies and by entertainers, in addition to Melissa Etheridge and Jim Belushi. Of course, Damien and Stephen Marley are, are on our board of advisors. Uh, Eric Rachmani of Revolution is a, is a huge supporter. Willie Nelson is a supporter. Um, uh, Beto O'Rourke, one of the leading Democratic politicians, has endorsed our efforts. Incredible. And, and then we're just seeing, a, a really, the industry is stepping up to the plate now. We just got a $250,000 commitment from one of the largest multi-state operators in the United States, AWH. Um, they are going to um, match every dollar that's donated by consumers in their stores uh, up to $250,000. So. Uh, we are we are um, assembling our war chest and and we're beginning to rack up some victories. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to report the release of Craig Cesal. Craig was incarcerated on a life without parole sentence, basically for repairing trucks that were used to transport cannabis. And uh, about a week ago, Craig was released on a compassionate release which is a temporary release due to COVID, but we're working to make that a permanent release and, and are fairly hopeful that it could happen. One of the most beautiful things that, that I saw was this picture of Craig and his daughter just as she, he was released. I don't know if you have one of those shots at the prison, um, but um, now Craig is gonna be able to walk his daughter down the aisle uh, at her marriage, which otherwise he would have been in, in prison for. So we are, we are beginning to see real results out of our efforts, and it's, it's heartening to me to see the, the, the kind of buy-in we've got. But um, we are just getting started. Uh, we had a really hard time counting the number of cannabis prisoners in the United States, mm -hmm. basically because the authorities, the people who lock up people on cannabis charges, don't want us to know. And they do everything that they can to hide or obscure that information. We don't know how many cannabis prisoners there are on planet Earth, but the last prisoner project is committed to freeing every single last one of them. And so for the international audience, we really encourage you to, the best way to begin these efforts is just figure it out. How many people in your country, in your city, in your um, uh, state or province are incarcerated on cannabis crimes? What kinds of sentences are they doing? And if folks could start collecting that information and send it off to us at Last Prisoner Project, that would be tremendously helpful. The first thing we need to do to, to attack the problem is get a handle on exactly what it is, what its magnitude is. So we are beginning to branch out now from our base in the United States because of the donations we've received. We're building out our staff and we're beginning to, to do what we've always intended to do, which is stretch our mandate all around the globe. Great. Nice. Give, give us an idea of the numbers we're speaking about, Steve. Is there, a ballpark, is there a ballpark figure as to how many people are incarcerated just on a cannabis charge? What, how big's the mountain you're climbing? Well, in the United States, we, we know it's a minimum of 40,000 people. We suspect that that, that uh, estimate could be off by as much as 50%. It could be 60,000 people. 
Um, uh, it's difficult to count. I'll give you an example. Somebody's doing a sentence for burglary. They get out on parole. They go to their urine test, and their urine test comes up positive for cannabis, and then they're returned to prison. Is that a cannabis prisoner, or is that a burglary prisoner? So it gets a bit complex, but here's what to think about. The organizations like the United Nations and the World Health Organization estimate the number of cannabis consumers worldwide at 150 to 230 million. I think that estimate is off by several orders of magnitude. So I would say there's at least 750 million uh, or a billion cannabis consumers on planet Earth. And I think that we can extrapolate from that. It's a, it's a horrifying figure if, if we have um, a, a billion, um, uh, uh, if we have a billion people on Earth and even five or 10 percent of them have at one time or another been incarcerated, you're talking about tens of millions of people worldwide. And uh, it, it certainly is a figure that's in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions worldwide. It's horrifying. As, as, um as the fact that the lockdown and COVID and the dangers of being in prison, have any people been released specifically in California because of that? Have they managed to release prisoners just because of the COVID? Because in South Africa, I think they released 19,000 awaiting trial prisoners and there was an absolute societal uproar because most people think when a prisoner is being released, he's an axe murderer or something, and he's been convicted. But most of the people in South Africa were just awaiting trial, low-level um, cannabis users. It's mostly drug offences. So they, th their problem is they've been dropped off in the high street with no buffer zone. It's like this double-edged sword. 19,000 people have left the prison, but then what? Is it the same in your part of the world? Yeah, you've touched on a few things there. We, we are seeing releases of fairly large numbers of prisoners, but that's happening in jails rather than in prisons. The, so far, the releases that we've seen from prisons where people who are convicted who serve longer sentences right. are housed has been far, far less than the number of people who have been released from jails. But you mentioned the problem of reentry. This is, this is another area that Last Prisoner Project is focused on because cannabis prisoners, regardless of when they're released, uh, come out with nothing. In many cases, they've been in prison for years. They don't have employment. They don't have a place to live. They don't have clothing. They don't have transportation. They usually don't have a savings account. And in many cases, they've been estranged from their families. So one of the things that Last Prisoner Project is doing is creating what we call the prison to, proster <clears throat> excuse me, prison to prosperity pipeline. And this pipeline has a number of different aspects to it. There's a mentorship program which introduces recently released cannabis prisoners to executives in the cannabis business, in the cannabis industry. Wow. There is an employment program. We're working with uh, probably the largest cannabis um, uh, human resources recruiter, Vangst. And Vangst uh, is working with us to uh, make all of our released prisoners um, available to cannabis companies that are looking for employees. And, and so we'll get them hired up. Uh, we also have a training program for released cannabis prisoners. They start to um, orient them to the demands of the legal cannabis business, which are, of course are very different from the unregulated cannabis business. And, um, and we're moving forward on, on all of those fronts. Uh, again, there's been some success. Uh, if you check out the uh, episode four of my podcast, Radio Free Cannabis, you'll uh, see an interview with two recently released uh, cannabis prisoners, Evelyn, La Evelyn LaChapelle and Stephanie Shepard. And their stories are, are incredible in many regards. But towards the end of the episode, they talk about what a difference has been made in their life by uh, being embraced by the legal cannabis industry. And Evelyn, in, in particular, has this very poignant story. Before she served five years in prison, Evelyn was a catering coordinator for one of the most famous hotels in San Francisco. After she was released, she got out and managed, because there's a law in California that says you cannot check a person's criminal record before hiring them, she managed to get hired by another very prestigious San Francisco hotel, but a coworker of hers Googled her, 
found out about her criminal history, gave that criminal history to the Human Resources Department at the hotel, and Evelyn was fired. Uh, but I'm happy to report that shortly after she was fired, we introduced her to a cannabis company called Virtosa, which is a leading cannabis extracts and elixirs company located here in Oakland, California. And she's now the community engagement manager for Virtosa, and she's getting ready to launch her own brand of accessories. So That's awesome. um, wow. it's a big, <laughs> big struggle. There's a large mountain in front of us to climb, but we're already seeing success. Um, I was going to get on to the Radio Free Cannabis thing. Uh, uh, Steve, it looks great. At episode number four. I'm sure you've got lots and lots of guests backed up for that one. To be on a podcast with Steve D'Angelo must be a bucket list thing for all of us worldwide activists. I'm, I'm absolutely available. Remember that, okay? I'd re I, I just want to change direction a little bit. We, it's taken us a while to catch up with you. You're a busy man, and then Myrtle and I travelled a lot, and in the lockdown... But going back a bit to the end of last year in Las Vegas, you received a Lifetime Achievement Award. And that was the time when I was trying to get hold of you. Because I think that is one of... Um, you've had many awards during your illustrious career poking the beast. But that must have been a pretty good one for you. That must have been a great feeling to get that one from your peers, yeah? It was a, it was a wonderful feeling. It's really... You know, I, I've done all of this work out of love for cannabis and love for cannabis people. And to be one of the first two people inducted into the Cannabis Hall of Fame was a, a great honor for me. And uh, those kind of honorings are really the most precious reward that I can get for my work is, is the appreciation of the community that I've worked to serve. It's one of, it's one of the furthest places that we could possibly travel to in the whole world. For me to leave here to get to Las Vegas, it is basically the other side of the world. We've tried it before. We went there, we went to Planet 13 for the day, but man, it was on all of our bucket lists to go. There was, a, there was a South African presence there, but we just couldn't have made it because I would have been first in the queue to shake your hand, man, because for me, you're one of the most eloquent, conscientious activists that are out there. And, our time is coming, Steve. The conscientious cannabis is just around the corner because um, as far as we're concerned, looking at the headlines for the last couple of years as legalization evolves, there's been some very, very badly behaved people in cannabis. Don't you agree? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I, legalization is a double-edged sword. Uh, it's something that we absolutely have to pursue for our freedom so that people stop getting arrested and thrown in prison and having their lives destroyed because of cannabis. But we also know that once we legalize cannabis, then you have very large, well-funded and quite ruthless corporations coming into the cannabis industry. And what we found in most places that have gone through this transition is that those corporations are better equipped to win licenses, to attract capital, to secure real estate, and do a lot of the other things that are necessary for success in the legal cannabis industry. That, um, that dynamic has led to a lot of legacy cannabis uh, business people, the people who have carried this plant through prohibition and then carried it through the gray market are being squeezed out. It's, it's incredibly unfortunate because uh, the people who are coming in, for the most part, don't know anything about cannabis. Many of them don't use cannabis. They certainly don't have a deep personal relationship with the plant. And so my largest concern is, is the role that these corporations are going to play in introducing cannabis to people who aren't familiar with it. And I, I, I think that you're right, that I believe that, that conscious, what I call conscious, what you call conscientious cannabis, is going to rise, but but it will rise because we make it rise. Yes, it's so true. Um, yes. We are all we're, we're we're all the conscious cannabis people. I, but let me just introduce the crew a minute, Steve. Buzz is over here. He's our MC. He's been sat in that chair for nearly 140 episodes now. <laughs> yeah. Dan is our grow specialist. Uh, Joe is one of Myrtle's angels at Fields of Green for All. And um, we've all been very, very excited to hook up with you, really. Yeah. Like. Um, do you think, 
do you think <laughs> do you think there is a silver lining for cannabis because of this whole pandemic story? Do you think there is, because it's now an essential service and it's still illegal that that, that it will never go back to being completely illegal? Do you think there are some positive takeaways from this whole situation that we're now in? Well, there may be some positive takeaways we don't even know about yet. Let me ask you a simple question. Do you know anybody who's a regular cannabis consumer who has been struck with a severe case of COVID? <laughs> no, we ask no. it all the time yeah, of no. all of our all guests, Steve. No, we don't. And we were saying this months and months ago as a joke, but now we're actually saying it more and more seriously as time goes on. Well, it's not a joke. Um, in fact, there's a substantial uh, body of already existing science that explains why cannabis may in increase re resistance to the virus or maybe even prevent infection. Uh, and, and that's a body of science which I think our community has been timid to advance um, because we don't want to make outrageous claims. Yes. But, um, mm -hmm. but now uh, I think that it's, it's really time to, to, to elevate this conversation. So one of the projects that I'm working on now is putting together a global poll for cannabis consumers so that we can really get our finger on this. But it seems to me in, in my anecdotal research, and I've been asking everybody that I know, and nobody has been able to point to a regular cannabis consumer that's had a severe case of COVID or died from it. And I think that, 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 um, that that's a dynamic that we have an obligation to, to pursue and understand. Mm -hmm. That's a great, uh, what a nice parting shot. Mm. When we, the last time we were together, Steve, in Harborside, you had some, we all had travel plans. All our travel plans have now been shelved somewhat, but um, you do have a bed for the night in Johannesburg. You, you do know mm. that and bring as many of your closest friends as you like and we'll take you all around the country and show you some pretty remarkable things. So I, I, I've watched a couple of your, uh, there's been a couple of webca webcasts that you've been involved in. We all of us here have been very involved in webcasts. It's been an incredible thing to be able to see your peers and see learned people pretty much for free on the internet. I hope that continues somewhat. It's it's been wonderful, right? Uh, I was uh, going into the lockdown really concerned because I spent 200 days on the road last year, and my intention was to spend the same period of time this year with the mission of introducing the global cannabis community to each other because there's there's hundreds of millions of us all around the world collectively we're larger than than almost every nation on the earth so i, I was really disturbed that my travel plans for this year were interrupted but then i found myself connecting with a larger number of people than i ever right. have before through the virtual <laughs> mediums i spoke yeah. to over three million people on 420 that's magnitudes more than I've ever spoken to before on that date. It's been pretty exciting. I've done, uh, I've, we were doing a webinar just before this, and it, it really has transcended the boundaries of, we, we've managed to keep this show together because of that kind of technology for yeah. the last two months. We've only just managed to get back together on the couch now, Steve, for the last, for, the, for two weeks, for yeah. three months, we were in little boxes on the screen, totally <laughs> isolated, but now... The lockdown here has been softened slightly, and now we're just mm. taking a chance. So, um, Steve, we wish you well on your mission that side. Mm. Um, I'm, abs I'm sure you'll get to Southeast Asia. I'm sure you will get to, uh, Ameri uh, to uh, Africa in the end, and we'll, we'll pick you up at the airport when you do. Um, how does anybody in South Africa help you out with a thing like the Last Prisoner Project? We feel a bit hem helpless here sometimes. How can we help out you? Well, it's, it's very easy to plug into the Last Prisoner Project. Just go to the website, lastprisonerproject.org. What I would say in terms of immediate things that you can do is that we are in the middle of a campaign to release a prisoner named Michael Thompson. That is a largely a virtual campaign. There's a number of different ways that South Africans could plug into that campaign and participate. I'd also say stay tuned to Radio Free Cannabis Podcast. The uh, whole idea of the podcast is to take that work that I was doing, um, traveling, and bring it in virtually and introduce this global cannabis community to each other. So we are 
translated into 195 different languages on our YouTube platform. <laughs> and uh, I'll be talking regularly about all the campaigns that Last Prisoner Project will be conducting over the course of the, well, until we get that Last Prisoner out. Incredible, Steve. We love your energy because you have to have energy as an activist. You have to keep going. You have to keep picking yourself up. It's been really, really special for the crew yes. to have you on the show because re we really look up to you for your staying power over the years. And um, maybe we get you on the show again towards the end of the year to see how it goes. And as, as I say again, we'd love to see you in Johannesburg and I'm sure we could fill an auditorium or two with you. We could. Yes. Or five. Well, we, we will talk soon um, because I'm going to invite you on to Radio Free Cannabis. Oh, I will yes. be talking more soon, but... I really look forward to coming to South Africa. I've been learning a lot about the African roots of cannabis, uh, some really interesting stuff that I want to explore and learn. Yeah. So thank you for the kind invitation and I will be there as soon as we can. Steve D'Angelo, thank you very much for your time. You're a really busy man, super. It's made it, it's, for me personally, it's made, a, made me feel great talking to you. Thank you, man, <laughs> super. Thank Stay you lit. so much. Stay lit. Be well, be free. <laughs> <laughs> Let's no, take no, a he's... moment to breathe after that. Oh, no. oh. Now I can get grilled. I can just be a stoner again. Now it's hard, hard work being in the zone of like um, interviewing icons. You know, he's no, had many no. questions put to him over the years. I just don't, you don't want to fuck that up. That's it's a legit OG alert, guys. Folks. What an honor! Just to there's a great picture of him on the great. internet in um, around about 1990 outside the White House pinning a banner on the gate of the White House and that started all off 40 something years ago you know? yeah. so if it wasn't for him there wouldn't be any medical in California and Harborside, Nelia was at Harborside with us filming, it's massive there's a queue out the door all the time and it's just so freaking normal yeah. it's just people buying just some normal. weed and leaving and going home and smoking the shit yeah. Damn just it. on the way home, on the way home, on the way home. Ah, oh, I'll just pull it to the weed store. Get the yeah. Weed. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. you're driving home. Oh, oh shit, I'm late. Yeah. Well, oh, like fuck, it's like, poker night. Yeah. Like I checked there, it's Steve's pussy. It says you can just pull it to the parking lot. It's as good as a fucking drive through. <laughs> <laughs> just.